Okay. Hi, um, I'm Paul Riley, and this is a joint paper with Ian Dawson, who's from the Winchester School of Art, and my colleague Lu Louisa Minkin, who's from Central St. Martins in the University of Arts in London. Uh, it, it's about two projects, two case studies. Uh, they, won't bend, they won't bend your brain too hard, but they're, they're two things that have happened to me by accident in the, uh, the last couple of years. So what we're trying to do is explore how digital technologies can enable many radical uh, different viewpoints to coexist and circulate, enable much richer multifocality, and um, to create new narratives around things which are normally, um, it's ironic that I'm reading this out to you, uh, delivered by white male Western scientific discourses. So, um, so the first case study is very quick. Uh, the Nesclyph rediscovered. So the Nesclyph is a piece of rock I found on one of my excavations in Shropshire. And this remarkable thing has a cut mark and it is being cut with linear features and et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic piece of thing, interesting, you know, blah, blah. Um, the trouble is, it was found in the backfill of some previous excavations, and we don't know which way is up. Well, that's the problem. So I can tell you my, I, well, I've published my, my version of what it was. Uh, but what I was most interested in was how do we connect this to the communities in the area we live? And uh, that was my first mistake. So we've been doing lots of different types of imaging. So we've got structure from motion, we've got 3D printing, we've got reflectance transformation, structured light, blah, blah, blah. We've hit it with everything. But we still don't know which way it's up. And I decided, um, and we've got no other parallels to this particular type of thing. In the short version of this, I think this is a depiction of a Romano-British god of the uh, tutelar name of the tribe of the Cornovi. Uh, which is accounted for by Ptolemy in the second century. You've got lots of Roman pottery there. And Cornovi means two things, of the peninsula or the horned ones. So my narrative is a better one. So I'm like, this, this guy is that way up and he's a tutelar deity. But I'm not that arrogant just to say that. So what we did is we thought, all right, we want to make the local community aware of what we're doing and enlist them to tell us if they've seen anything else that looked remark anything like this around. So we did two things. We wrote a little paper for CBA, for the British archaeologist, uh, and we wrote another one which we gave to the press office in Shropshire County Council. So the first one, the academic one, we had five or six replies, and they were very polite. They gave us extra references, good parallels, blah, blah. The Shropshire County Council press brief was fine. It began with you know, local people saying whatever, whatever. And then the BBC picked it up. And then we started getting other things. And then we knew something that had escaped us when a guy sent me a letter from Western Australia who was working with Aboriginal uh, native people, rock art there. And then it, we started getting letters in Brazilian Portuguese. Um, we're, getting letters, we're getting letters from people that I've read about your article in the Straits Times, uh, Singaporeans. Kiwis, Australians, uh, Omanese, translations into Finnish, blah, blah, blah. We had hundreds of them. And we, Gary Locke and I, uh, who were running this excavation, we replied to everybody. And we were doing it for several months. There were hundreds of things from all around the world. And this is what they said. So I, I've gone out there and told you now that I think it's a second century AD Romano-British depiction of, so it's figurative. This is what came back. They said, no, I, I think it's a map. I think it's ancient script. It's old Finnish. It's a sacrificial, lots of, lots of gore came into the, the feedback. And um, one wag said, no, it's instructions for second gear on a chariot. Uh, so, and this links to the, the, the depiction I'm thinking of. It's more like Canunus or uh, Pan or the, Mon the Minotaur and so on. Lots of people, particularly in uh, the former colonies talked about sh shaman and things like the pipe player, so it's not necessarily a worry, it could be, and it could be depiction. Other people said it's a, it's a depiction of a, a druid making a sacrifice rather than just a sacrificial altar. Someone said it was a helmeted warrior, but one say particularly it's a sword waving Boudicca, and another one thought it was a space alien. So 
the object's gone out as a simple image. This is one image, one view, one image, but we've got multiple viewpoints of people who are not listening to the Western discourse. The other thing that was most interesting about this is a very large number of these people came back, uh, answered our, our replies to them, said thank you. But most importantly, a lot of people said, thank you for asking us. And it was really quite astonishing. Um, what does it, we don't, I don't think we asked the question, what do you think it is, often enough? And this come home in spades for my second case study. This is called Mudu Gakyo Sin, which in um, Blackfoot language means distance awareness. Uh, one of the elders, elders of the Blackfoot nation, who's sadly de deceased now, said this, new and changed technologies can work against the people or be harnessed and used in their own worldview. Um, this is a 3D print of a, uh, a, a knife, which is part Sheffield steel, and the other part is uh, worked uh, Blackfoot hafted handle. It's just to give you the idea that the collaborators in this are the, the white specialists, the people outside, and the technology are the collaborators I'm referring to. So what's behind this is the Mutu Kwakusin project, the distance awareness, is an anti or decolonial exercise. So the people of the Blackfoot, the, what the, one group of them, the nations it's fragmented, we're dealing with are in Lethbridge, um, uh, Alberta and Canada. And they wanted to find their objects which had been taken, misappropriated into the West. And there's quite a few of them in Britain, and there's a couple of, couple of collections here in Scotland, one in Aberdeen University, one in the National Museum. Um, and they are using technology to present these objects which were lost, and these objects are called belongings. So they don't behave the same way as we see an object, they believe as if they're living things, and they have a history, and they want to connect with the, their, their past, their ancestors. So these, these objects, are tremendously important to these people and they're scattered around the world. And we, and we unfortunately, in Britain have quite a number of these things. So uh, they will be put on this site, which makes them available for people in Blackfoot territories to talk to Blackfoot people and ch children and students about their culture. Um, and we'd arrange for people to come across to look at the collections to see what was, they thought was important, what should be repatriated, what could be uh, repatriated through technology, and what should not be shown, what are sacred. So that was what's behind it, and COVID arrived. So the elders, the Blackfoot people who were supposed to be coming, couldn't. So we then had to scramble to figure out how could we deliver the experience Bearing in mind that we know one of the targets is going to be this Blackfoot website, uh, we were still very anxious about what was happening here because um, we're all white Westerners in, in our museums. And these, both the, the previous Donetskliff and all these objects are a limited access, and we, we are providing the access and the story behind them. So what we're trying to do is break that. Now, our inspiration for this is um, a bird which in North America is known as the chickadee. And the chickadee is what we call a cultist, actually. It's a flocking bird, and in North American native uh, laws, it has a very strong position. And in Blackfoot um, law, it, is, um, it has this very peculiar um, property that they apparently they flock together and they're able to dart their eyes out and look at objects and people and things from multiple angles. That's, that's, that's the, the, the folklore. So we thought about, well, how are we going to make a virtual chickadee? Bearing in mind, we didn't have any money for this at the time, but we did have access to some of these museums. So you can look at, um, make sure I'm going to get ahead of myself. Right, so the chickadee, the eyes coming out of it, one of the things we said, we just said aloud one day, we could, put, we could put eyes in our hands. And what we went by that was, 
we could put imaging devices all over the place. And so what we did do is we had a whole load of Zoom sessions on phones, doing low level. Some of them were static on tripods, and some of them were uh, in people's hands. And uh, we also had a high definition feed going through as well. And we brought out some of these objects, which we, we talked about. And I can't go into the details of how we got to these, this set of objects, but this is in the National Museum here in Edinburgh. And there's about 24 objects came out. And the elders and knowledge holders of the Black Rock Nation were in um, Canada. So what we did here was in that room, it's got all these monitors like this we've got here. There were all the things going on. There's a whole series of microphones and there's a whole series on all of those chats. There was a whole series of conversations going in in parallel about these images. So these people here, the elders, would ask to say, can we bring up camera three? Can you go over there? Can you turn this over? Can we look at the other side? So it's not rocket science, but it was absolutely an amazing experience. So they, so the curators are also part of this. So we say there's archaeologists, there's artists, there's curators, there's the, the actual people that the the um, the cultural owners of these objects uh, are on their side. And so here we go. We look in some of this quill work, detail, beautiful images, and we have conversations going on. Can you zoom in? Can you do that? And then over here we've got other people around. I was actually in Hampshire at the time. There's Andy Jones in Stockholm and various other people around the world joining in these conversations. Um, so when you get into this, so it's not really hard to understand like this presentation. When he said, for instance, can you turn this over? An object which is normally either only shown in the catalogue on the other side, the beadwork, um, when it's turned over and made presented to a knowledge holder, who actually was people who created this thing. This is called a cropper. When they turned it over, you can see that it's actually made by Levi Jeans. And, um, and while this conversation, by the way, with the, while these conversations are going, I should have said on the previous slide, um, as you discuss these things, the people in there go, they'd open up their window and say, oh, that stitch work is this. And they demonstrate how the stitch work would now work. Or an elder would say, well, that's, this is this. Is this and, you know, what does the catalogue description say? No, that's wrong. You've got no idea what's going on. But this one's quite interesting. So there's, there are, believe it or not, people in the world so geeky, they study genes and Levi genes. So it turns out, you can find out from Den and Bro, something of a community, uh, that this was, these genes are from about 1890. And they're quite swanky ones. So the, they, they're not your average labouring genes. They're actually genes of um, someone higher up, so like a store owner, a trader owner, like those stuff. So it's it's a bit of it's a bit of sociology in this as well, which was not apparent before, uh, which came out of the conversations. This one, when the chickadee went inside, you know, uh, an iPhone went inside a moccasin, they discovered that the uh, it was reused painted hide. All these things have never been known. <laughs> Most of the people these belong to never get to see them, never physically come. So everything we were doing was changing. The important point I'm trying to make is we are changing through imaging and the availability of access, we are changing culture. We're changing their culture and their views by this. And they're changing our culture about us understanding some of our own collections. Um, so I want to finish on this. Uh, 3D printed axe. So I'll read it if that's because you can't read it at the back, I suppose. As this 3D printed hybrid indigenous colonial knife demonstrates, the digital processes developed here change culture, our own and those of the peoples we, they study in the past and the present, who now reflect back at us, like the chickadees looking at both, both ways. The plethora of viewpoints and connectivity aids decolonization. Uh, aids decolonization by enabling multiple perspectives and ways of seeing, imagining to be accounted for beyond the strict academic white, Western and male view traditionally promulgated. Decolonizing computer applications in archeology span and digital heritage more broadly places a huge ethical burden on all of us to embrace and be led by those gracious enough to share the voices that have been disregarded and actively silenced for so long. So 
we're, we have the opportunity to, um, as our community as facilitators, to listen to these voices and um, rather than seeing these objects as moments of uh, looting, we can reconnect them back with the cultures and affect those people and our own, uh, our own cultures uh, quite profoundly. So I think as digital archaeologists, we have an important and pivotal role to uh, be involved in more of these projects. Thank you.